Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Welcome to this second webinar of a five-part bi-weekly series on Africa's COVID-19 response. This webinar series is convened by the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and FHI 360. My name is uh, Dr. Doris Macharia. I'm FHI 360's Regional Director for East and Southern Africa, and I'll be facilitating today's very exciting discussion titled COVID-19 testing. How well do we know this epidemic? But before we get started and settled into our discussion, a few important things to note. There is no chat function in this webinar and primarily because we want to avoid unwanted intrusions and disruptions, what you know, is commonly known as Zoom bombing. Um, but nonetheless, please rest assured we have incorporated all pre-submitted questions into our discussions today. I also encourage you all to ask questions on Twitter using the hashtag that is shown there, hashtag AskCOVIDExperts, and we will answer your questions over the coming days. On behalf of FHI 360, I am sharing with you a section of the statement from Patrick Fine, our CEO, and you can find more detailed um, statement on our website, www.fhi360.org. We stand in solidarity with everyone that rejects racism, misogyny, and all forms of discrimination. I really want to thank you for your attention. And with that, some brief thoughts from my end as we begin today's discussion. There is no doubt that diagnostic testing is an important entry point in prevention to care to treatment continuum. And currently, there is no country that really knows the number of people who have COVID-19. The World Health Organization has provided a benchmark guidance of 10 to 30 tests per confirmed case as a good indication for adequate testing. What we know is African countries have tested around about 1,700 people for every 1 million people, which is pretty low. And to understand the magnitude of COVID-19 outbreaks, you know, countries must definitely fast track their testing to enable governments properly prepare their health system and other sectors. And I think more importantly, mitigate morbidity and mortality. So moving on, I'm really very excited to introduce our panelists today um, and I will introduce them and I'll ask them to give a few opening remarks. So our first uh, panelist who is not new to this uh, webinar series is uh, Dr. Ahmed Oguel Ouma. He is a senior civil servant, a public health expert, he has been a pioneer in supporting governments to implement the World Health Organization Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. He served as an advisor in the Global Coordination Mechanism for Non-Communicable Diseases at WHO in Geneva. In Kenya, Dr. Oguel was the founding director of the Ministry of Health's Division of Non-Communicable Diseases. He is well versed in how governments work and how to support governments in achieving desirable public health goals, especially in resource settings. Dr. Oguel is currently serving as the Deputy Director for Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, which is a technical agency for African Union. Welcome, Dr. Oguel. Few remarks from you, please. Um, uh, thanks, Doris, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, it's a pleasure to once again be here with uh, colleagues from FHI 360 uh, discussing um, our current global predicament of COVID-19. Pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Dr. Gwell. And our second panelist is a good colleague, Ms. Janet Robinson. She's a certified clinical pathologist with a specialization in medical microbiology. She has more than 30 years experience in medical laboratory diagnostics, clinical research, regulatory affairs and quality assurance, as well as clinical trials. She is currently serving as FHI 360's Director of Laboratory Sciences. 
For the past 16 years, Janet has provided leadership to FHI 360's laboratory strengthening activities, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa and South and Southeast Asia. Ms. Robinson has helped build the capacity of laboratories and diagnostic facilities in a variety of infectious diseases in over 40 resource limited countries. More recently, Ms. Robinson has been providing technical support to 13 countries to enhance their ability to detect COVID-19. Welcome, Janet. Thank you, Doris. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to join this panel um, to uh, share information about how countries can improve their ability um, to detect COVID-19. Um, and certainly the laboratory side of things is actually critical to countries being able to respond to this pandemic. Thank you, Doris. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janet. Uh, really lovely to have you here. And uh, last but not least uh, is our third panelist. Uh, this is Dr. Nafisa Choten. She's a public health officer in the Division of Laboratory Systems and Networks with the Africa CDC. She holds a PhD in medical virology from University of Stellenbosch in South Africa and has more than eight years experience in public health issues, in particular virology, molecular biology and epidemiology. She has worked as a scientific editor for the past five years and more recently as a section editor for Africa CDC's Journal of Public Health in Africa. Welcome, Nafisa. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and to share some of our knowledge and experience uh, with everyone. I look forward to a very productive webinar. Thank you. Good. All right. Maybe to start us off, um, you know, uh, just uh, a couple of days ago, I was reading an article and uh, it was on the Independent Online. It was by Matthew Winkler. And this is what the headline read. This is what it said. COVID-19, believe it or not, Africa is outperforming the rest of the world. Hmm. And I thought to myself, this is really a great discussion for us today, especially as we look at it from a COVID testing lens. So let's start with you, Dr. Oguel. We know African countries need to accelerate testing. Based on your work with Africa CDC and that vantage point of supporting African countries, how well are we really doing? Um, uh, thanks, Doris. And um, uh, it's really uh, a very timely discussion around uh, issues of uh, testing for COVID-19 um, because uh, of the numbers that are coming out of uh, uh, the African continent. And uh, hopefully by the end of uh, the session today, we'll have a little bit of clarity. I think it's important to uh, first um, appreciate that um, Africa CDC, a relatively young organization, only three and a half years old, is working uh, very closely hand in hand with uh, all the 55 uh, countries on the African continent in building capacity and uh, in ensuring that um, uh, we have uh, effective um, uh, activities around uh, preparedness and response for COVID-19 on the continent. We are, we are really uh, honored uh, to be the pioneers of Africa CDC working with our member states and partners uh, on the continent. So um, I think uh, first we start, I don't know whether And um, our case fatality rate remains uh, pretty stable at about um, 2.7. It inches up to 3% sometimes, uh, but it is roughly um, uh, around um, uh, this figure. It has not changed uh, by much. Now, if you look at that graph, uh, you will see that Africa generally, in as far as the African Union is concerned, we divide it into five regions, the Southern, Northern, Eastern, Western, and Central uh, Africa regions. And if you look at um, uh, that graph uh, that uh, shows the number of confirmed cases on the continent, you will see that the southern region is really the most affected at the moment. And um, uh, it is um, as a result of uh, uh, the numbers that are coming out of South Africa, uh, which are really relatively high when you compare to all the other countries in that particular region. But if you look at that graph, uh, the numbers coming out of the southern Africa region are quite steep. 
uh, starting from some time in mid-May, um, the graph went up quite um, uh, dramatically, very comparable to other parts of the world. Uh, the lowest will be uh, still in Central Africa and a bit, uh, to some extent, the Eastern Africa region, uh, where <clears throat> the graph has remained relatively flatter and the numbers have remained relatively uh, slower. And of course, um, we are looking in detail at why these numbers are fewer, particularly in the Central Africa region, as we will see when um, we go into, into the next slide. And um, <clears throat> testing really is very key to understanding um, uh, the pandemic. Uh, you need to be able to identify those who have the, the virus actively. You need to isolate them so that they do not affect uh, other members of the community and therefore interrupt uh, transmission. And um, uh, we uh, can only be able to do that uh, if we know who they are and where they are. Um, and this is um, uh, bringing me to this particular graph of um, the confirmed um, uh, uh, tested cases with a little bit of um, the journey through the last uh, few months. Um, if you look at the number of tests that we've done, as of this morning, we are just about 3.8 million tests that we've done on the African region. And Doris, I agree with you that uh, when you look at our tests per million, it's still uh, relatively low, um, and there are reasons for that. Our positivity rate is still around 7%. And um, when, we dig, uh, when we dig a little bit deeper into the data, um, it tells a very interesting story. Uh, 10 countries contribute 79% of the overall tests that are being done. Uh, so this tells us that uh, there are countries that still need to be able to catch up with the number of tests that are being done in those countries. And uh, this is um, uh, really one of the key concerns of Africa CDC and uh, is um, uh, what, what um, uh, really is driving our uh, sort of um, direction in as far as initiatives is concerned. Uh, those 10 countries, we put them up there um, so that um, you could be able to see um, that they are spread across um, the continent. It is not located in only one place. Uh, so uh, geographical location has nothing to do with it. Uh, there are other things that uh, hopefully we'll find time to discuss one day. Then if you look at the, um, uh, the, the, the calendar of events, if you want, um, sometime in uh, mid-March, we had the first um, donation from, uh, just back to the last slide, please. Uh, we had the first donation from uh, uh, Jack Ma. Jack Ma has donated uh, significantly to Africa's efforts for COVID-19 three times. But <clears throat> from the very beginning, the key problem has always been the availability of test kits. And um, if you look at the donations as they came um, uh, from Jack Ma, the number of testing uh, figures also went up. Um, secondly is um, the initiative that um, the chairperson of the Africa Union Commission um, launched some time in uh, mid-April, uh, which we call PACT. This is the Partnership to Accelerate uh, COVID-19 uh, Testing um, uh, in Africa. And um, when you see when we launched PAC sometime in mid-April, and when we actually rolled it out uh, in the first week of uh, June this year, you see the numbers are inching up. And these numbers are inching up because we are making more tests available. We are actually ensuring that um, uh, countries are um, uh, uh, having the capacity they require to be able to do the testings. And uh, we are also um, ensuring that um, uh, we are uh, providing guidance to countries in as far as testing is concerned. Uh, more specifically, when we look at um, our PACT uh, uh, strategy, um, there are several things that we are doing. One is this continuous supply of test kits and related supplies. It is very critical that countries feel comfortable enough that they have the tests uh, available. That way they will be doing the testing as a per protocol. We don't want people to be holding back from testing um, because of worries that they will not be able to have uh, adequate uh, test kits. So this, uh, this area we have covered quite well. And um, as I said, over 3.7 million tests have been done, out of which uh, just over one and a half million have come from us directly as Africa CDC and Africa Union. And the rest is a mixture of other um, uh, donations and country level purchases. Uh, the second thing that we are doing is um, we, are we are encouraging countries to decentralize testing so that things are not just happening in one reference lab in, uh, in the capital, but that we are encouraging countries to 
utilize all the um, available um, uh, assets that they have in as far as lab is concerned, whether it is research institutions, it is universities, it is uh, vet, uh, veterinary labs, it is private sector labs. Um, they need to be able to expand availability of um, uh, uh, this um, uh, testing is very important and not just in the capital city, but across the country. Decentralizing labs uh, 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 and testing sites, very, very important. And of course, because there are many different platforms that are available, um, it is um, a lot easier um, to be able to encourage countries to uh, decentralize uh, their testing using all the platforms, whether they're gene expert or whether they are uh, the regular uh, RT-PCR uh, uh, machines. The third thing that we are doing is encouraging countries uh, to automate uh, laboratory testing. And the need for automation is because of the numbers that are growing. If you look at um, uh, from sometime in, uh, uh, towards the end of April, the, the graphs have started going up. And this can only be sustained if we actually automate uh, our testing. So we are encouraging countries to automate testing. That way they can be able to have larger numbers uh, uh, that are being tested in any given time. And the different platforms for automated testing are available and countries are being encouraged. Those who have been using them for HIV, for example, we are in cons uh, consultation with the companies that provide these platforms so they can be able to be used for COVID-19. And where appropriate in a few countries, we're actually asking the, uh, the manufacturers to open um, uh, these platforms for use um, uh, with uh, reagents that are not necessarily from their own companies. And we are seeing that is contributing to the increase in uh, the numbers that are tested. The fourth thing that we are uh, encouraging countries to do is pooled testing. And uh, um, I think uh, Ghana is a very good example for this. They've been doing uh, active pooled testing and this is encouraging the numbers to actually um, uh, go up a lot more. Um, and um, I think um, as countries understand how to manage pool testing more, we expect that over the next um, uh, so many weeks, as we increase um, the, test, uh, the testing capacity at country level, they will be able uh, to increase uh, their testing uh, capacity. Yeah. The fifth thing that we are doing is um, encouraging countries to increase uh, the lab um, uh, health, uh, lab scientists and the lab uh, workforce. And uh, as Africa CDC, we have been doing this from the very beginning in February when we started capacity building. In the beginning, it was face to face, but then because of travel restrictions, we have shifted that uh, to online uh, trainings. Um, and we have covered now literally all the countries on the continent. And uh, this is one of the key things that I think is a, a, a very clear win. Uh, that um, we brought uh, uh, to the table. So building that capacity is very critical for expanding testing, for um, decentralizing testing, and of course, increasing uh, the number of tests that are being done in a day. Uh, very quickly, uh, the two last things I would like to say is um, for countries that have problems with uh, testing and for large countries where specimens need to be transported from one place to another, as Africa CDC, we are actually supporting uh, um, uh, and strengthening specimen transport systems. That way, um, we, we are relatively comfortable that uh, if a test, um, if a country or a, a, part, a, a part of a region of a country does not have immediate capacity to be able to test, then they have access uh, to a lab that can go to do that testing with a relatively short uh, turnaround uh, uh, times. Um, uh, finally, I would like to touch on, um, I don't want to call it controversial, but a relatively uh, heavily discussed area of uh, rapid tests. Um, we have just released last week our guidance on uh, uh, rapid tests for COVID-19, uh, but we are saying that this should only be used for surveillance and confirmatory testing must go back to uh, PCR testing. And I think it is going to change the way that we understand the burden of uh, uh, the disease on the continent and each country can then be able to plan better and as Africa CDC, we can also be able to plan um, a lot better. And finally is all this cannot be able to happen in a vacuum. We must provide good information to members of the public. We must provide good training to the professionals who are working, whether it is in the lab, it is in the community or it is in the hospital. Risk communication, providing um, uh, adequate information in a timely manner is extremely important. And we keep on saying that um, 
the only reason why there's a lot of fake news and there's a lot of rumors is because there are gaps in the knowledge. So the knowledge has to be delivered in a timely manner, on a regular basis, and the correct information being shared with members of the public. In this way, we remove the stigma. People will be more likely to come and uh, uh, get themselves tested. We understand then the, uh, the burden better, and we can be able to plan um, uh, even more effectively. So we are understanding um, this pandemic in Africa. We are planning for it appropriately, and our initiatives and strategies are changing as we go along. And we are quite confident that um, uh, uh, we uh, should be able to keep this uh, curve relatively flat and uh, secure uh, Africa's health. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ahmed. You've just mentioned, I think, something very critical is about uh, capacity. Uh, and, and, and maybe just to jo Janet, uh, Ms. Robinson, high COVID-19 testing capacity, as Dr. Ahmed has mentioned, and we've been talking about it quite a bit, is a requirement for tracing, isolating, and treatment. You know, what have been your experiences, especially in Africa, and what, what should we be doing differently or more of? Thank you. Thank you, Doris. So, you know, Dr. Arne made some very interesting and important points. Um, uh, but the reality when you actually come and try and introduce those types of uh, strategies uh, can be quite difficult. Um, you know, thinking about the capacity to do tests, you know, there are so many factors that um, uh, influence that, you know, from getting you know, good quality specimens to the testing lab in a timely manner you know, sufficient trained human resources to do the testing and sufficient, you know, instruments and reagents. And each of them we're experiencing have got a number of challenges. <coughs> Excuse me. You know, in, in terms of, you know, in terms of just the, the PCR instruments, um, you know, the tests are quite difficult to do. Um, they need to be done in a contained biosafety level two laboratory uh, with separation between rooms where the different parts are done. Um, and, you know, BSL-2 laboratories are not so common in Africa as they are in some other countries. And it's interesting when we look at the, the data that Dr. Ahmed shared, you know, the countries that are doing the most testing, they're also the countries with the most BSL-2 laboratories and the most PCR laboratories. Um, and so when, when countries move to decentralize, you know, some of the capacity issues we're seeing is, you know, just you know, are there sufficient BSL-2 laboratories? Are they in good quality? Are the cabinets maintained? Um, and then, you know, what experience do those te technicians have with doing PCR? Um, and so you can build that capacity, you can provide training, um, but that's often much more successful when there's perhaps ongoing mentorship to, to really build those skills. Um, so, you know, getting instruments, getting, uh, testing capacity, getting competent technicians is challenging to do, particularly when there may be limited um, people in the country with the experience and, and your challenge from bringing in interna international experts because of travel restrictions. Um, and then we look at, you know, just the, the, the sheer volume of capacity of reagents and equipment that are available. Um, and we've pr seen, you know, pretty well a, a worldwide shortage of uh, reliable, uh, emergency approved test kits and reagents, um, you know, across the testing platforms um, and countries are urgently needing them, but they're in extremely short supply and there's, there's very little we can, we can do to affect that. Um, and so whilst manufacturers are trying to ramp up their, their testing capacity or their manufacturing capacity, um, that is sort of limiting the amount of expansion that could happen. Um, and then in terms of the capacity to get the specimen to the laboratory, um, you know, this is perhaps one of the first fundamental challenges that we face. You know, countries often have um, uh, specimen referral systems for specific diseases and then, you know, general systems. Um, um, and, you know, this may be a, a process that is split into a number of steps that a specimen gets from the collection site to maybe a, a pickup point and then it gets to the testing lab. Um, and making sure that that sample is kept at the right temperature under the right conditions so by the time it gets to the laboratory it's, it's still suitable for testing. Um, and so, you know, Dr. Ahmed is right, you know, that really is, is the first part of the chain to ensure we've got a good sample. 
um, in order that you know when we get to the laboratory, it's it, it's you know a good enough sample to be tested. Mm. And, 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 and maybe just on the gene expert, I think uh, Ms. Robinson and also Dr. Gwell, you mentioned that. And I think we were all very excited, especially here in the African continent, really, because we knew gene expert, we've been using it for TB diagnosis. But, you know, it is, it is, a, good, it is a methodology that is being used. But, you know, what are the pros and cons of, of this testing approach? And also when you're thinking about crowding out TB, you know, what are your thoughts around that? Because are we going to start sort of commandeering all our gene experts in this particular instance to do more COVID testing? Uh, you know, what do we need to do about it? Maybe let me start with uh, Ms. Robinson and then to Dr. Gwell. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think many countries have seen the gene expert COVID as the, as the light at the end of the tunnel, because um, uh, it can produce a, you know, a rapid, accurate result in a short period of time. Um, you know, the challenges are uh, that, as, as you say, um, if a gene expert is currently being used for TB or HIV viral load, how much are you going to be taking away from providing uh, detection services to those patients? And so uh, countries really need to think about a strategy as to how to operationalize, um, you know, use of gene expert for COVID so that the other diseases don't suffer. But it is a great opportunity to maximize use of the instrument, particularly if um, you know, they're not working at full capacity, you know. Um, but the cons of it are, and there was a recent uh, WHO biosafety guidance, um, which was reissued on May 13th, which talks about some of the biosafety considerations for using gene expert for COVID um, and making sure that, you know, the appropriate safety controls are in place. So they're encouraging facilities to do risk assessments, to look at how they can safely use uh, gene expert for COVID because, you know, in many countries where we see gene expert used, it's in, you know, settings which are not, you know, biosafety level two and WHO accepts that they don't need to be, but there needs to be additional controls. Um, so countries need to be really careful about which gene expert sites they select and they, they uh, um, provide training in how to do risk assessments and training in how to use the technology to safely detect uh, COVID-19. Uh, oh, Dr. Gwell, what are your thoughts? Um, th th this is an opportunity mm -hmm. for countries to be able to uh, improve their systems, not just lab, but also surveillance and uh, clinical management. And um, um, most countries, because of the sheer amount of um, um, let me call it fear that has been generated around COVID-19, they will use whatever resource that they have. Mm -hmm. It's also an opportunity for us to build capacity appropriately. And this is what we are doing at Africa CDC. We are insisting that um, countries must uh, be exposed to the right way of doing things. They must get the correct um, designs of labs and um, uh, under what conditions to use which type of platform. Um, and in this way, um, even after COVID has passed, we'll have a much better uh, understanding of how to utilize um, the capacity that we are building. Uh, secondly, is, um, it is an opportunity uh, to show to governments that public health and um, clinical uh, care is an extremely important part of the development agenda. Uh, so all the money that has been used to buy tea and have meetings, we are asking countries to redirect them. Uh, get your um, appropriate uh, platforms for your labs, uh, train your health workers better, improve your infrastructure in the health uh, facilities. We can drink tea and read newspapers later and have meetings that, uh, um, <laughs> when the COVID has already been handled. So that extra resource that is being uh, made available should be used, and we are encouraging countries to do that, should be used to strengthen the whole health system so that uh, its resilience is going to um, come into uh, play when the next outbreak comes. And the next outbreak is coming. That, that there's no doubt about that. It's not an issue of um, uh, how far down the road. Um, uh, it, it's an issue of um, how prepared will we be when it comes. So if we strengthen our health systems now, um, appreciating all the challenges, uh, then we will have actually used this outbreak uh, 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 well. If we miss it, then we will actually have missed a very, very good opportunity to strengthen the health system. But the challenges are many, 
and uh, we are encouraging countries to take advantage of the extra attention, extra uh, resources that are being made available for COVID-19. Yeah, I like your statement on no more teas and no more coffees. <laughs> I think I think that's we should all we should all start. I think have that in mind. But maybe Nafisa, I mean, you know, we we've we've talked. I mean, we've seen our you know the, our COVID nineteen experience in Africa, and we've changed a number of testing strategies, right? Uh, some of which have been alluded to by Dr. Guell and also Miss Robinson as well. Um, you know, what are the sort of viable strategies uh, in terms of testing? Uh, must we incorporate nationally? What must we be doing now, especially as we are seeing our, our cases, some of them going up exponentially um, in terms of where we are currently? Yes. Right, thank you. So, I mean, it's true that, you know, um, what we need to think about is really like, you know, we've mentioned strengthening our, our, our system so that uh, really we can uh, on the long term we can hear you. I think you're muted. Just unmute. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Sorry, the system is a bit funky. Sorry. Yes. So um, I think you see what I would also like to, to add with regard to uh, our ongoing conversations is that one of the strategies that we've uh, we've been mentioning is decentralization. And I think that is key because um, I'll take the example of uh, Mauritius, which is where I come from, but to, which is also where, you know, they've really taken control of uh, the epidemic and there are currently no cases there. So what they've been, uh, and well, they're also an island nation, so it's a very small place. It's a bit easier to get a handle uh, on the epidemic. But what they've also done is to increase uh, the level of testing that they can do by getting help from um, other institutions, academic institutions, research institutions, just to be able to expand the testing. And maybe this is something that, you know, on the long term, we need to think about. Instead of having a centralized system, we need to be thinking about having a system where, you know, in bigger countries such as Nigeria, you know, Ethiopia, for example, even, to have systems uh, in different states which would be able to handle the level of testing that we require right now during uh, such an epidemic. Um, and this has highlighted, you know, this, uh, this gap that we are seeing currently. And only now are we trying to decentralize some of the testing that we are seeing. For example, uh, as you've seen in one of the slides uh, during Dr. Ogwell's uh, presentation, in Central Africa, you see that the level of testing is quite low. And they've only recently started decentralizing uh, their testing in Central Africa. So yeah, this is, would be one of the things that I definitely think we need to, to incorporate going forward. Mm, I, th I think very, very good. I, and, and, and we've also been talking a lot about also, um, apart from the decentralization also, do we really need mass testing at the end of the day? Um, you know, is, is, that, is that a viable uh, approach um, on the, 18th, is it today the 18th or 17th? 18th of June and going forward with our epidemic. What are your thoughts? Uh, let, me, let me start off with, with Janet. Should we still do mass testing or you know, a decentralized approach? Is a one shoe fits all? Um, I don't think one, one shoe fits all, um, but certainly there does need to be significantly more testing in Africa. Um, we get, go back to the title of this webinar, how well do we know the epidemic? You know, without testing, we don't. Um, and, and, you know, more specimens need to be collected, we need to get numbers up to more the levels that we've seen in Asia for countries that have successfully um, responded to, to the pandemic. You know, um, if we look at perhaps Vietnam, which has got, I think, the highest uh, testing ratio per, uh, per population, um, and the fact that they've had a very successful response to the pandemic with actually zero deaths. Um, and, and, I, and we see China did the same, um, Thailand as well. So I think there's, there's clearly some, some models there that increased testing helps countries better understand the pandemic um, and take appropriate action. Um, uh, you know, in, in, in terms of being able to do mass testing, um, you know, one of the strategies that 
Dr. Ahmed I mentioned at the beginning was around this idea of pooled testing, where you know specimens from different patients are all pulled together and, and one PCR is done. And if everyone if that pool tests negative, then everyone in the pool tests negative. Um, and, and countries have to do some optimization work to understand just how many patients you put in a single pool. Um, based on their positivity rate, but that would be another cost-effective solution to be able to increase the amount of people tested and reduce the cost per test or per patient. Um, and so I think that's, that's one very good approach that a number of countries are, are, are considering and, and piloting at the moment. Thanks, Janet. And I'm just also reminded recently uh, we, you know, there was some evidence showing, you know, that how asymptomatic um, COVID-19 uh, patients really play a role in terms of transmission. And because of a lot of backlogs uh, in terms of testing and other challenges, you know, a number of countries and states in countries have revised their criteria to only look at symptomatic. Uh, you know, what are your thoughts on this, uh, Dr. Oguel? Is this the right approach? What do we do for their symptomatics? Um, as Africa CDC, we are very clear that uh, asymptomatic um, individuals are actually a very significant uh, driver of uh, this particular pandemic. And um, we cannot leave them out of the equation of um, uh, strategizing how to identify them and test them. Uh, and if you look at our PACT um, initiative, it has three uh, main legs. There is test, there is trace, and then there is treat. So um, just increasing testing without addressing the other two Ts um, will uh, form a gap. And that is why the asymptomatic will be uh, lost and will continue to spread uh, the virus. So when you test and you get someone who is um, uh, positive, then you must trace their contacts the best way you can using the protocols that are already in place. And um, when we do that, we find that um, um, indeed the vast majority of those who are being picked up um, during tracing are asymptomatic. Uh, so it means if we left them in their community, then they will be um, a very key driver uh, of the pandemic and the numbers will then be able to go up. So uh, we must um, put down strategies that are very clear on identifying um, of all who may have been exposed, asymptomatic or otherwise. Uh, we must, uh, and that is why we have released also um, last week, um, the guidance on rapid testing for surveillance, because then it reduces the burden of um, having positivity rates of, uh, um, I don't know, 7% or thereabout. Uh, if you do surveillance with a rapid test, then you can be able to reduce uh, the number of uh, individuals that you take for confirmatory tests because then you'd be uh, removing a, a large uh, chunk of, the, of those who are being tested uh, through relatively cheaper uh, means. So um, uh, we need to think through the whole cycle from testing to tracing to treating and uh, ensuring that uh, we identify everyone, whether symptomatic or not. Um, and uh, when we are going to do mass testing, I don't like the term mass testing. It suggests um, that there is no thought process that it is going in. <laughs> I like to talk about targeted testing. It can be huge numbers, but it needs to be targeted because a public health science thought process has gone into it. That way we get better use of the investment of, uh, of, the, of the tests that we have. And when we combine that with uh, rapid tests for surveillance, uh, we should be able to get um, um, many more um, individuals uh, that uh, need to be confirmed uh, or uh, we then rule out um, a, a large chunk of the population without uh, uh, taking them through the whole process of PCR testing. Over. Yeah, th thank you so much, Abuel, for that. But but I think also one of the challenges we are having a lot, I think with the, you know, with the, like I said, backlogs and, you know, the challenges we're having in testing, you know, you know, we've been seeing a number of countries, um, some antibody testing have made their way. I, don't ask me how, but you know, it is happening. And, um, and, and it's there and it's the reality of, you know, where, you know, where we all live. You know, what is the role? You know, you did mention a little bit in terms of the role of antibody testing. You know, what's the role of antibody testing, um, at least in, in, in the current, in our current COVID-19 pandemic. Maybe you're going to start with you and then we can turn it over to Janet. Yeah. Um, yeah this is Nafisa's area, so okay. she, 
Okay. Nafisa, over to you, maybe. Yes. <laughs> okay. And you're muted. It's fine. I keep forgetting that it is. Sorry. Okay. All right. So we've got uh, two forms of uh, the serological tests that we find that some countries have been using. And uh, some of them have been using the antigen testing, which we prefer because you know, they are a bit more reliable than the antibody testing with regard to letting you know who uh, is infected or not. And uh, that's the test that you know, uh, I think most of the countries have been using. But with regard to antibody, we do find that there is a role uh, for antibody testing uh, as well. And what we recommend is that if there is someone who is um, symptomatic and who presents in a, in, a, in a hospital setting, for example, we could use the antibody testing on them to, like you said, because there are several backlogs on um, um, molecular testing. So this could be one way of reducing this backlog because this person has presented uh, with symptoms. But if they are presenting with symptoms and the test is negative, you still do obviously confirmatory, like you know, Dr. Orwell has uh, clearly stated, confirmation is always with RT-PCR, but with, you know, because of uh, time constraints, you do want to uh, get the test done um, on this person. So that's uh, what we call triaging in a healthcare setting. Uh, we can also use it uh, for contacts of confirmed cases, but you see every, every public health action that you uh, implement is not done in isolation. It is done with something else. So yes, you would do the testing on the contacts, but you would also advise them, even if their test is negative, they still need to isolate uh, at home. Uh, or yes, they still need to isolate uh, at home and limit the contact until you know we see whether symptoms uh, develop or not. Um, and also in a surveillance, this is not now not for diagnostics, but more for surveillance in the country, maybe to identify pockets of you know infection that were you know unknown before. This is something that you know we could also use. Uh, this is where you know uh, we see antibody testing uh, being used. Um, but definitely what we recommend is if you are, if you need to do uh, testing with regard to diagnostics, antigen testing is the more reliable tool. But again, antibody testing is uh, also, uh, um, also has its use. And what I would encourage uh, our listeners is to access the guidance that we have uh, on this, um, on the use of the serological testing, which is available uh, on our website. And I'm not sure if someone can just share maybe a slide on that, maybe a bit later, but yeah, we have uh, this guidance that's available and that um, countries can definitely use um, to decide when and where uh, they can make use of this. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's been pulled up just for everyone. Just you can see uh, the interim guidance. You can find it at uh, africacdc.org. Um, you can download that. But uh, maybe ja uh, Janet, maybe just over to you. Maybe, uh, you, know, what, you know, what has been your experience, especially, of course, in Asia and Africa with regards to use of this antibody testing? And if you don't mind, even for our attendees, you know, unpacking further, you know, we've talked of diagnostics and surveillance, you know, are they one and the same? You know, when do you use what test and, and, and why? Okay. Yes. Yeah. At the moment, um the rapid diagnostic tests are only just starting to be considered to be introduced um, because countries have been waiting for WHO and CDC guidance on using rapid tests um, up and up until the guidance just came out. Um, you know, people were sitting on the fence about where this fits and really using their molecular platforms as the primary diagnostic for, for COVID-19. Um, you know, I, th I think what countries need to consider is that most of these rapid tests have been approved through emergency use authorizations, um, which means they haven't gone through the same level of quality testing and validation as would normally, you know, find, evaluate um, uh, many of these diagnostics. Um, there's a WHO pre-qualification process. So these, these rapid tests haven't gone through that. So you know, countries need to make sure they're comfortable that they validate and assure the quality of the test that they procure. But clearly, with so many new rapid tests on the market, you know, they are seen as another way to ramp up 
significantly the testing at a much cheaper price. Um, you know, where the issues come in terms of actually using them, you know, do you use them as a diagnostic, do you use them for surveillance? Um, you know, rapid tests, and, and again, it gets back to, <coughs> excuse me, it gets back to the title of this webinar, how well do we know the, the pandemic? And if countries use rapid tests incorrectly, it could actually confuse their understanding of the pandemic. Um, particularly the antibody tests, um, they will pick up um, so, so some of them are combination tests, they'll pick up the IgM, which is the first antibody that's produced um, when an infection starts, and then some of them are combination, they'll also pick up the IgG, which is the antibody that comes over time that shows immunity. Um, so if you're using a, uh, an antibody test that detects both the, the first antibody and then the second one, IgGM and IgG, you know, are you showing a positive, are you showing an active infection? Or a action, you know, and so countries really need to look at their diagnostic algorithm. And some of the countries, you know, I'm helping at the moment are looking at that, looking at their diagnostic algorithm as these new tests come on board. You know, the gene expert, the rapid tests. What are they suitable to do, and what confirmation testing needs to happen afterwards? So, um, as Dr. Nafisa said, you know, if an RDT is negative. That doesn't mean to say the person isn't infected. It just may be the sample was taken too early and the antibodies haven't been produced yet. And so sending that for confirmation testing. Um, you know, another, another way rapid tests can be used, I mean, these are all so far qualitative tests, but you do get, you know, a line that, you know, indicates that the antibody is being detected. Um, if multiple samples were taken over time, there can be some qualitative comparison of, Oh, has the line got a lot darker, indicating mm -hmm. there's more antibody, which would help to to indicate you know an active infection. Um, so there are you know there is a role for them, but countries need to really carefully look at how they use them and not use them in cases where you know really it's a it's a critical first line diagnostic. You know they shouldn't be for uh, determining to discharge someone from hospital or to return to work. Um, so that's where the diagnostic algorithm really comes into play. Yeah, and I think the way you want it. <laughs> yes, exactly. And, and and you know, as we obviously time time is uh, I think time is against us a little bit. But um, uh, you know, as we reflect on all the discussions we've had today, I want to just uh, uh, offer a statement, and would like to hear your reactions as we begin to to close out and wrap up. You know. Mm -hmm. If I need testing, I should be able to get testing. I should be able to get a test when I want it and when I need it. This is a COVID test. Uh, let me start with Nafisa. What is your thinking around that? I think that's a, that's a valid point. Mm -hmm. um, and I think maybe a, a personal experience I can share is uh, that for example, you know, in some countries, um, before you, you, before you travel, you know, for repatriation purposes, for example, uh, you actually need to get a COVID-19 uh, test before you can board the plane. Um, which brings, you know, uh, the question, uh, where do you get this test done? Um, are there, you know, measures in place in countries for, for this to happen if, you know, on a personal level, you do want to get tested? Um, I think it depends. Eh? Uh, personally, I think if the if there is the capacity to do it, um, potentially, yes, you could get tested. But then again, if you are getting tested and you have symptoms, what would you be doing? Would you be isolated? You know, are there facilities to isolate you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, if you can, if you are uh, feeling, if you have symptoms, but you feel that they are progressing, then you present uh, somewhere where you can get tested, then it makes sense because then you can be isolated and you can be treated, especially if you have a severe case. But if you don't and you are, you know, uh, in lockdown in your country, as you know, most countries are doing nowadays, you're inside, you're, you know, uh, in quarantine and or you, you know, if you're going out, you're wearing a mask, mm -hmm. then, yeah, I don't see why you yourself would want uh, to get tested because, 
the outcome at the end of the day is yes, you're found to be positive and then you are placed in quarantine or, you know, uh, I mean, there's, and as we know, there's no specific treatment that you would be receiving. So yeah, I don't know if I've answered your question. I feel like I've been rambling a bit, but. <laughs> uh, but so well, what about you? Should we all, I mean, if you, if I want a test, should I be able to get a test? I mean, we've had statements <laughs> such as this in the, in the past said. I think you're on mute. We can't hear your good, great, wise words. <laughs> Sorry, I became Nafisa there briefly. <laughs> no testing on demand. Mm. Okay. Several. One is that uh, test kits are difficult to find. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are uh, scrambling uh, to be sure that we get uh, these test kits to uh, where they are really, really required. Mm -hmm. um, we have provided very clear criteria of who uh, should fall within the bracket of being tested. Mm -hmm. um, apart from that, um, there are consequences to being tested. Um, so, um, for example, you need to prepare to be able to trace their contacts. You need to prepare to be able to look after those who have been tested. So waking up one day and you feel like, okay, um, let me go and get tested. This uh, changes the balance of healthcare access. And only those who can be able to pay for it will then go and get tested. But what we want is a public health good, um, uh, good um, uh, status now, where anyone who fits the criteria will then be able to get tested. And because we have um, um, a limited amount of the test kits, then we should use them in a way that has um, a very clear public health science behind it and the testing criteria are being followed. Um, and this way we are then using the, this uh, very rare resource in, a, in an effective way. No testing on demand unless you fall within the category that we have provided guidance of very clear who should be tested and who should not be tested. A time will come in the future. Um, yeah. uh, the virus is uh, with us and we have gotten used to it and it's gotten used to us. Uh, you may be able to go for, on, at your own cost of course, uh, but um, it should not be that you wake up and then you expect that the tests that were bought by Africa CDC are the ones that <laughs> are going to test you and yet you don't, have, you don't fit the criteria. No testing on demand. This is my position. Yeah, I think that that's very, very, I think, critical and must underscore that. I mean, there is a criteria. And obviously, a lot of this criteria we are seeing is going to change over time. Of course, as we look at our own you know, pandemic uh, in terms of very country specific. But I think that is really, really critical. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you've addressed that. But obviously, you know, we need to wrap up. And I want to ask uh, you know, our panelists for their final thoughts. Uh, I'll, I will start with uh, Janet, then Nafisa, and then finish up with uh, Dr. Ahmed. Janet, your final thoughts on, 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 on the discussion today? Yeah, thank you, Doris. I mean, you know, the work that, that uh, I'm leading at the moment through FHI 360 um, to really help countries um, be able to better detect COVID-19. And, you know, I'm thinking back to similar response for Ebola where you know, there was great international um, uh, support to address Ebola, but it was quite temporary. Um, and when Ebola was over in West Africa, those temporary resources went away. You know, we have mobile labs which are set up, but then they were removed. So I'm hoping that you know, through what we do to um, detect and prevent COVID, that we're gonna leave behind sustainable strengthening systems. Um, and it's not a, you know, a temporary capacity, you know, so then countries can, you know, better be able to detect um, and respond to uh, pandemics in the future. So that's really my hope and is that I know is what a lot of uh, partners and donors are looking at, you know, sustainability through their response, um, as well as obviously urgent immediate response. Thank you. Thank you so much. Nafisa? Yes. So, uh, Doris, thank you. And thank you for the opportunity of, you know, uh, talking today. I think maybe what I want to share with, uh, with the people who are listening to us, if, you know, um, there are lab scientists, there are people who are working in the labs and who need access to 
you know, suppliers. We are here at, you know, Africa, Africa CDC to support them in whatever way we can. And they can reach out to us either through, you know, the regional collaborating centers or through us directly. And uh, maybe a final thought from my side would be uh, if we can share a slide uh, on uh, the Africa Medical Supplies platform that we have launched at uh, Africa CDC, where we have secured um, testing kits, we have secured PP materials, we have secured a whole bunch of things that are available because as we know, procurement on the continent has been limited because some of, you know, some um, other countries have uh, either imposed export bans, so, or, you know, uh, procured everything for themselves. Thank you. So uh, on this website, you know, we have uh, ensured that, you know, there are several kits, several materials that are available for uh, the African um, population. So they, are, they should please make use of this website and order whatever they need. And if there's something that's not on the website that they require, they can also contact us so we can see how we can help with procurement. Um, again, this is a, a, a marathon. It's not a sprint. There's still a long way to go. So I hope we can all work together to fight uh, this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Nafisa and Ahmed. You have the honor of uh, yeah, wrapping it up for us. Uh, thanks, Doris. Um, let me start by saying that we are the vaccine. This is my favorite statement. We are the vaccine. It is our discipline that will actually interrupt um, the transmission of, of this virus. So we must exercise uh, personal responsibility and discipline and do the right things. This is the first thing I like to say. Second is that we are just in the morning of uh, this pandemic and as far as Africa is concerned. We have not even reached midday yet. So things are going to get worse before they get better. Uh, but we would like the worst to be low in terms of numbers. And that is why we have uh, put in place a um, very broad array of strategies with our member states and uh, our partners uh, to keep the numbers low. And we are confident that uh, we, if we follow the strategy we have put in place, the numbers will remain low. The third thing I would like to say is that the platform that um, uh, Nafisa has just shared is a very important acceptance in Africa that we do not have the manufacturing capacity locally yet for the things we need for outbreaks and other public health emergencies. And this is an opportunity for us to think beyond COVID-19 and start ramping up our ability to produce our own uh, supplies, um, to produce our own equipment, so that the next pandemic when it comes, and it will come, then we are ready for it in terms of uh, easier access uh, to those supplies and the equipment uh, uh, that are required. Uh, for members of the public, stay safe, be disciplined, do the right things, and um, you will interrupt the pandemic. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, uh, Ms. Robinson, Nafisa, and also Dr. Ogwell. We really appreciate your time to spend with us uh, you know, engaging and really sharing with us your vast experiences in testing and uh, we know we'll call upon you. And colleagues, those who are still on as we wind up and close, please make sure that if you've got any additional questions, we'll please use the hashtag AskCOVIDExperts. We will certainly answer those uh, in the coming days. Um, please make sure that uh, you go in and, and, and pose your questions. Thank you so much, everyone, and please have a good day ahead. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.